Welcome to Rathrum. There is so much history here. And there's so much that we want people to know and to be able to appreciate. For 27 years, Ratham was the county seat of Kootenai County at the time when Kootenai County actually was seven counties, as it, if we count them now. There were going to be five transcontinental railroads, and the northernmost one is the Northern Pacific Railroad. And they, Isaac Stevens from Washington Territory came over and surveyed this area and decided it, it made sense to put Rathrum in as a depot. And he put a marker out on the ranch, which is now owned by the Salties. And that was in 1850. 1863, how, um, it was written up in the state legislature, how would Kootenai County become organized, as they called it, and organized men created. And um, why, and what would be the county seat? Well, they knew at the time that the Seniaquitine Trail, say it, Seniaquitine, uh, was used by the Indians, and it means following the lakes. And this Seniaquitine Trail was the trail that the uh, that the Indians used to go over across the continental divide and get their buffalo. This Seniaquitine Trail was also the ones that the um, fur traders used that David Thompson, they say that David Thompson actually spent the night on the southern part of Twin Lakes. Rathrum is 37 miles from, or 27 to 37, from Spokane. According to a conductor I talked to, it, it's that length of time when the old steam engines had to load up again with wood and water. We have lots of wood. I mean, we still do. And the water, Frederick Post bought the ranch where, with the marker for the railroad in nine years before the railroad came through. So he must have known something. And he was an engineer and he brought the water from the top of the mountain down to the uh, site of Rathdrum and into three faucets, according to the first um, to attempt. And so the railroad had their water and their wood, and that's why Rathbone became a depot. And when they, um, the train came through in 1881, it stopped here and the whole tent village of workers, mostly Chinese, moved on toward Lake Pondere. And the people had to stop here and get their supplies and change over to horseback of some kind. No matter there are no cars then. And they, they would go to, um, up to the Corley Mountains where they just discovered gold. And Wyatt Earp and his lover Josie, as well as Wyatt Earp's brothers, they came through here in 1882. So... Rathen became the seat, even though in the first census, which was 1880, there were maybe 27 residences in the whole area. And in the 1880 survey by John B. David, there are only three or four houses in this the site that was to become Rathen. So the state had determined that at least 50 men who voted had to sign a petition to organize Kootenai County. So here's what happened. Charles Wesley Wood married Post's oldest daughter, Mary, and they had a son. And Charles Wesley Wood, who was called Westwood, 
he was a mail carrier and he had his horses here. And he would take mail from Walla Walla up to Colville to the fort there or over to Missoula around Lake Ponderé. And we, his building existed for his, his house and his stable existed for, uh, up until the 1950s when I finally fell apart. So they decided to have this site that Charles Wesley Wood had uh, legal rights to. In the, the oldest history of, Rath, of North Idaho, that was written in 1903, they said that Post bought the squatter rights from Connor and gave them or sold them to Charles Wesley Wood and his wife. I can't find any legal proof of that. In fact, Connor, who was supposedly the trapper here, he had a roadhouse up the road about four miles. Lewiston was, a, was the uh, land office at the time. And somebody decided, a bunch of people decided, the sheriff decided that, uh, uh no more Lewiston, we want Boise to be at the Capitol. So they went in and stole all the records from Lewiston and brought them down to Boise. And I think they lost a few because I can't find any evidence of any of Post's legal documents. The courthouse was on the corner right across the St. Stanislaus Church, where there's now um, a Mason, a Masonic temple. It had room for 24 offices because they made two more additions after the first 1886 try. We have wonderful pictures, and I hope that you'll look at these pictures and realize that the walls are painted with lead and the ceilings were decorated to keep the heat in. They usually boarded up the windows like in here um, so that the heat didn't escape. But they were roomy and they looked quite nice. So I hope you enjoy those. The all other thing they did was build a vault for the records. And it, I can't find out where that vault was. I can't find any picture of it. But um, it was attached to the courthouse on one side and the three other sides were open and it was lined and it was a very well built vault. When we lost the county seat, the all records of course went to Coeur The cells came from the jail and they also went to Coeur D.C. Corbin and Hauser, who was from Montana, was a miner. They decided that Coeur d'Alene should have their own railroad. So in, in 1886, I believe, they made a spur that came from Hauser Lake Junction up to 3rd Street. And you've seen the depot there. It's beautiful down in Coeur d'Alene. And then you go down 3rd Street to the wharf and you could take a boat to anywhere you, you wanted to go to the Coeur d'Alene Mountains, etc. And now that Coeur d'Alene had their own um, railroad, they tried to send a bill through that they should be the seat. And they promised every, they say, divide Kootenai County in half, let Sandpoint take half, and we'll take half, and we'll call it Lewis and Clark. And luckily, they voted no. So they had to try again once more, right? And so, but the people said, you have to have, the people should decide. So in 1908, they had a, a vote and the Coeur d'Alene people, remember um, George Wanagot had by that uh, time moved back. The Coeur d'Alene people offered chicken pot pie to anybody who vote for Coeur d'Alene. And they promised St. Mary's that you can have your own county too and you can be county seat. And they did a bunch of things under the, under the cover but probably it was for the best. But anyways, they they decided Coeur d'Alene would be the seat. The first thing we did is we built stores to take care of all the people that came in on the, on the train and bought their supplies and headed off to seat gold in the Coeur d'Alene Mountains. Or they came here to build stores because of that actually where the really money, real money was. They built stores. They had mills here to, to make the lumber for the stores. And guess what? 
the population went from about, what, six or seven to 2,000 in a very short time. In fact, they say that for about three months, I think, Rathlin was bigger than Spokane Falls. As we mentioned, there was a gold in, in Coeur d'Alene Mountains. Well, the mine owners were pretty vicious and they put the miners into what they call the pen and did a whole lot of things that you shouldn't do to another person. So Darrow, Clarence Darrow, he was a fighter for the workers and he came to Rathman because they decided to have the, the, the court here that accused um, Sam Adams of killing these um, miners. And the mine owners were behind this whole thing because they wanted control. And Clarence Thero spent the whole summer here. He stayed down in a little cabin, a little bit farther from the jail, and, and uh, defended Sam Adams. The witnesses, including Sam Adams' wife, they stayed in the absolutely beautiful hotel called Mountain View. And Mountain View was built in 1895. When we lost the sea, they tore apart the hotel and they sent the material to be used elsewhere. In 1884, we had a fire. And that fire decimated a good portion of First Street, which is what we call Main Street now. And there was a lady who, she and her husband started a hotel called the American Hotel. And that went up in flames. And so she wrote down, I think it was George Wanakut who started that fire because he is the only one who had a good insurance on his building. His inventory was not in his store the night of the fire. He moved somewhere else. So her reasoning was pretty good. But the nice thing about it was there was a man who guarded the records. Remember what happened to Lewison? Was it going to be happen here? Was that the reason for the fire? Maybe. Anyways, it failed. And the guy got $25 for watching over the records. The 1924 fire, there was a man, a visitor, we don't know his name. He came to stay in the hotel here and he tossed a cigarette out the window. And that started a fire in the curtain, which then went on, obviously. And otherwise, well, usually they could have taken care of that little fire. As, as uh, Clifford Mullane said, who was a, a, a resident, a long-term resident of Raftrum, if I had to do a big whizzy boy, I could have taken care of that fire myself. But um, there was no water. They were, Edel Blue was fixing up the um, reservoirs on top of the hill so that they were, um, to make them bigger and better. And he was about finished, but there was no water in town. And so most of the Main Street burned. And we have lots of pictures because there was lots of really nice stores and stuff here still. But because of that, a lot of people didn't rebuild and, and they moved away and the population sunk to about 694, I think. How did it get the name Rathrum? They wanted to call it Westwood because Charles Wesley Wood was called Westwood, right? Um, the United States Post Office said, uh, uh, sorry, you can't, there are too many towns already called Westwood. So I can imagine these guys hanging around the post office trying to figure out what to do. Well, Malcolm Cowley, who had a bank in Spokane, and he invested heavily in the, at the beginning here, was a very nice man. He said, well, I was born in Rathrum, Idaho. And can't you imagine these men standing around and saying, nobody else would ever want to call their town Rathrum. So they called it Rathrum. And by the way, there are only two Rathbums in the whole world right now. The f first couple of years, we had wooden um, jails and the prisoners dug out or they would set a fire on um, these old jails. And so finally the commissioner said, oh, oh no, 
let's have a real metal jail. So they got four cells. And the people around here, the older people say, yeah, and they put them out in the winter the first year. I don't think so. I think they covered them. But then when they finally got to building the jail, they said, let's add a second set of cells because four cells is not enough. And if they were two cells on each side and a corridor in between so that you could you know, get washed or whatever your business was. And then on the second tier, which was come up, had a ladder going up to, they had four more cells. And that they put in the cell room. And um, they didn't weld it at the time. It was too early for that. Nor did we have water, by the way. Nor did we have electricity. Remember. So they had wood stoves. But we had good metal doors. And we had um, metal cells. And the trouble was this. Somebody had to feed the fire. So we also had, so we had the big metal door and they would let out, I would think, one or two prisoners who would feed the fire the whole night. But they had to be observed fairly regularly because they could take the knife and take out the grout and get out that way. So everything was a, a way decision. The poor house. There's in this hotel, in this jail, there's one room and it's labeled the county hospital. And Dr. Wentz did come in and look at the people, but it, the space was limited. You could get 22 people, I think they said, into this jail, but that's putting two people in each cell. So right away in 1898, they rented the house that was right beside the Catholic church. And this lady ran the poorhouse for about two years, but then her husband had an accident. So they bought the house of M.D. Wright down near the park. And they could room 25 people in there. And they had their own vegetables, their own meat, uh, and they took care of the park. And this poor house could not be taken to Corlane, and Corlane found it too expensive to do that part of the um, obligation of a county. So that the poorhouse stayed here until 1956, when it was sold as a private resident. And the the budgets in the first um, years in Kootenai County, most of it went to the poor and indigent. I mean, that's not the Wild West you read about in the, in the books, is it? Or see on the John Wayne, Wayne movies. But by the way, this jail was used as, once we lost the county seat, it was used as a library, it was used as a local jail, it was used as a maintenance shop. But when the roof began to leak, um, the city gave it to the historical society and said, you get a grant, and they, we did to fix the roof. There's so much history here, and there's so much that we want people to know and to be able to appreciate, like the fact of there being no water. And you have a WC, but there's not room for a toilet. There was a bucket there, thank you. And there's so many things, so many technological advances that happened in those 27 years. We got the electricity, we got telephones, we got cars. We even had barnstormers and, and airplanes that came down here. So what we'd like to do is have some more volunteers who'd be willing to help us make a database or something that would, somebody could just immediately go in and find all about their relatives or all about a house or about life in general in Rathrum. We'd love to have it. So I, I hope somebody in the audience or I guess somebody would Say, yes, we want to do that. Okay, so thanks for listening.